Welcome to episode 225 of the Grip Strip Podcast, the family first edition of the Grip Strip Podcast. My name is Philip Matthew. I'm your host. I'm with my co host, the iRacing Indy 500 champion, a computer genius, a gentleman, and a scholar, and someone who was able to celebrate with his father yesterday on Father's Day. His name is Joshua Fine. What's going on, brother? It doing great, Phil. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks for that. And um, yeah, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there, of course. And I uh, hope everybody had a great day yesterday. And of course, very family first and great day for uh, Ryan Blaney, of course, winning uh, for the first time this year in Iowa. And a huge win there. So yeah, ready to get into it. Yeah, that was the only major motorsport on deck that was that we talk about in terms of the major series uh, on the show. So we'll talk about YRB dominating the first Iowa Cup Series race and um, becoming a winner in all three major NASCAR series at a racetrack uh, by going and getting that first uh, Cup Series race win as well. Uh, he won his first truck race there back uh, 12 years ago. So, and then like a few years later, also won Xfinity. So, been a great racetrack. It's one where they, I mean, they brought up the fact that his mom, Lisa, was from Des Moines. It was like a, an hour away and all. And uh, the Buckeye Bullet, his dad, Dave Blaney, was there and was able to congratulate. Uh, Ryan and Uncle Dale, who's also a legendary driver too. So it was a great big family affair there. Another one who uh, has family ties, of course. Uh, Sam Mayer's dad, former racer, pretty terrible, but he was much better at business. And uh, his son is a much better race car driver, and he's had a lot of momentum. Uh, he goes out there and uh, puts on a a clinic of sorts goes out and gets that win, gets in a little bit argy bargy with uh, with O'Reilly Herps, it sounds like, but you know, that's that seems to be kind of par for these younger guys. But in terms of Sam Mayer, it just continues his momentum in the Xfinity series. He started out really, really slow this year, having a lot of issues, but once he got that uh, photo finish win at uh, Texas over Sieg, he's kind of just taken off from there. So we'll get into the Cup and Xfinity. We'll talk about, briefly talk about the U.S. Open, uh, which saw Bryson DeChambeau become a two time U.S. Open champion, give Liv a second major uh, in the last six, um, and, uh, or seven actually. And, um, you know, it's a, uh, and Rory McIlroy was on the other side of it. It was quite an interesting week for him. Uh, had the lead with five holes to go and proceeded to bogey two out of the last three holes to go from uh, winning what was possible to winning his first major in 10 years to um, basically giving the damn thing away and leaving in a huff. Um the 24 Hours of Le Mans took place this past weekend. Uh, Porsche showed their strength for a good amount of the week, but when push came to shove, the old usual suspects came out, the likes of Toyota and Ferrari, and Ferrari has repeated. The other, the 51 won last year, the 50 took the overall victory this year, Rain played uh created havoc for a good amount of the race they had to spend a lot of time under yellow um which probably affected the result a little bit as well uh similar to 2004 rolex but much more higher quality um in terms of the cars and stuff um gt lm gt3 was quite competitive and um the lmp2 cl class saw um, an Indy car or possible future Indy car driver uh, as part of the winning team there. So we'll go and uh, review that in the roundup. 
supercars were at were Darwin for the Triple Crown there. Misano held uh, World Superbikes. And then this weekend's jam-packed six hours at the Glen, one of my favorite races, period. The Indy Next will be at Laguna for a double header um, instead of them having the Freedom 100, uh, which you know, still is mind-boggling. Uh, F2, F3, and the F1 Academy will all be at Barcelona. Uh, so we'll preview those and also the NHRA Virginia Nationals. So they were off a couple weeks and now they're back. We will go and make our picks for the Spanish Grand Prix for Formula One. Will it be Fish Lips or will we see Lando or Charlie Claire or Carlos Sainz or possibly Mercedes? Maybe. Um, we'll talk about all that. Um, they've changed the track back to the original, somewhat original configuration meaning those final two corners are two 90-degree rights, um, fast right-handers versus a god-awful um, Mickey Mouse chicane that they've been using for I don't know how many years. Uh, so there will be uh, probably a lot more passing uh, because of it and more a little more mistakes as well. So we'll see what happens with that. We'll preview IndyCar at Laguna Seca. Um, I think we talked... Did did we talk about Fox? Yeah, I don't know if we... No, I don't think yeah, we really did. We didn't did, so... And then, and Fox... Yeah, so takes over IndyCar coverage. Um, thoughts on that... And then um, we'll do Cup and Xfinity picks for New Hampshire. Josh will let us know all things going on in the world of iRacing and gaming in a sim segment. And then we'll uh, call it a day. Uh, first, we will start with uh, the Iowa Corn 350 NASCAR Cup Series event. Um, first ever Cup Series race at Iowa after... Um, what is it, 17 years uh, of trying. Rusty Wallace wanted a cup date all those years ago when they opened this racetrack, I think in 2007, I think is the correct, I think, or 2006 or five, five somewhere around, it was somewhere in there, in the mid or early mid of that decade. Because um, I know Andretti Autosport won a lot of races there in the early years. Um, yeah, so that, that was in the early, mid 2000s, somewhere there. And it's been, so it's like 17, 18, 19 years. It's been a while. So NASCAR finally, Cup finally came to Iowa. The Xfinity series came back. There was a full, a regular practice session for one of the rare instances these days. A lot of tire issues came up, which, I mean, to be fair, it's Goodyear. So what do you expect? Um, there, The reasoning was they were going a couple of seconds faster, I think, or at least a second faster than what they were doing in the test. Um, you can also come up with any number of other excuses, next-gen car like Kryle did for what happened to him. Uh, you can come up with the fact that they decided to essentially paved the corners in the first two grooves and then left the straightaways alone and left like the higher groove the top lane uh, alone uh, with the original pavement so that also changed things up the way it raced yesterday and this weekend was more like an intermediate which to be fair, with Iowa Speedway, it is the length of a short track, but it's always kind of been that, you know, hybrid where it had short track characteristics, but it also had a uh, one and a half mile cookie cutter kind of characteristics in the way that they were racing it in certain ways, uh, especially with the cup car, made it more like a one and a half mile racetrack and i i think that kind of 
brought about where you know you saw the Hendrick cars were up there. You saw some of them Gibbs cars. Uh, well, really one Gibbs car um, and the and a couple of the twenty three, the two twenty three eleven guys, but. There were usual suspects. I mean, rare uh, issues for uh, Dennis Hamlin, like uh, Josh, you mentioned there. I mean, he was nowhere the whole entire night, um, which usually doesn't happen. I mean, that crappy... I mean, that's one thing we'll talk about, is that god-awful yellow um, that they called in the middle of a green flag pit stop sequence uh, where Hemrick goes and hits the wall, but... There was at least six other guys, I think, that had blown tires before that. What was it? There was like Chastain, Jones, Sindrick. Uh, I mean, I I don't know. I I feel like Grala might have too. Um, I, I I know it was a lot, and uh, and they didn't bother to throw yellow in any of those instances, but then they throw the yellow there. Um, ruined the day for a lot of guys. Ruin. I mean, Christopher Bell was fucked. I mean, he fucked himself in practice when he hit the wall, um, and wrecked his primary. Uh, but it made it worse. You know, guys like Chase Briscoe, um, who actually had a fast race car, was up front early. The first pit stop was the beginning of the end of his day. Um, needed to take multiple wave rounds only to end up having to pit with like eight laps to go and finish basically tailback. A lot went on, but one thing that was for certain was um, Ryan Blaney, who started on the outside pole and lost the pole on the last qualifier, which was Kyle Larson. Um, he ended up being the beneficiary of some issues for Kyle Larson, uh, even though he was able to win a stage and uh, finish second in the other. And Larson ends up... Uh, yeah, that, that saved his day because he finished well back. Um, Kyle Busch also, they said, water pump issues because the belt came off after they had done repairs to, I think, uh, Toe Link on his left rear or something with the suspension, then the water pump belt just flat came off. So nightmare scenario for Kyle Busch. The issues of the last couple of months continue. Um, the rage was pretty contained for him compared to where it's been in other, in uh, other races. Um, probably because like Ross Chastain, Friggin' fucked him up, but um, went through all that. But let's go through the results here. I mean, essentially, the race was dominated by two people Ryan Blaney, of course, led 201 of the races, 350 laps, and Larson led 80 laps. So, 280 out of 350, had two other double digit lap leaders, Josh Berry and Bob or and Christopher Busher. Um, Ryan Blaney gets the victory. 11th win of his career. First win of 2024 for the defending series champion. Uh, his future brother-in-law, William Byron, finished second. Um, one of his uh, BFFs, William Clyde Elliott II, was third. Christopher Bell, fourth. <laughs> Featured at one of his best racetracks, definitely wasn't there initially, uh, started tailback, but got up to finish fifth. So one of his best runs of the year, while his, uh, one of his bosses is working on TV. Uh, Joey Logano, sixth. Josh Berry started third, finished seventh, got... Um, was in position. He had, was leading the race, took four tires while Blaney took two um, and was able to hold off people there. Alex Bowman from 33rd finished eighth. Daniel Suarez was one of his better runs of the year. And then Brad Keselowski fell back early in the race but came back up, finishing the top 10. Ross Chastain, I mentioned him. He had tire problems, but 
recovered. There were only 14 cars on the lead lap, so Chastain, Gilliland, Justin Haley, who had a really fast car all weekend, and then Carson Hosevar, um, who was involved in a all spire wreck to start the race, basically where um, I think he he was the san he was a meat in a sandwich where Zane Smith got loose, or yeah, Zane Smith got loose underneath, got in a, a Hosevar who then um, took out uh, Corey LaJoy who was driving the Iowa Hawkeyes car, and then people were making jokes about Kirk Ferentz and his terrible offense um, because it took three laps for him to be spun out, and they made three and out references there. Uh, yeah, so then, yeah, so 14 cars on the lead lap. That was largely due to that last run, which um, the last run was... Two so two seventy so eighty four laps, and that went uh, uh, with no cautions the last eighty four laps. Um, so yeah, I mean there are people that would probably be pretty aggrieved with what happened with them all weekend. Um, I think the likes of Larson who got into an incident on one of the restarts with Suarez. Suarez seemed kind of punchy. Literally and figuratively, since he's has punched out Michael McDowell at one point in his career, um, getting into people and uh, he was uh, out there kind of roughhousing it. And him and and Larson got into it there. Uh, Larson rare, rare instance where he has bad luck, um, so probably took away a likely win there. Um, Kyle Busch was running in the top 10 for a good amount of the race before he had his wreck um, and in issues. So yet another race where um, the result doesn't fit how he was running. Um, so that and losing a lot of points in the process. Tyler Reddick ended up a lap down and he was way better than where he ended up. But I guess the strategy and or the way things worked out tire cycle wise just screwed just him, screwed him over you know we mentioned Hamlin had problems the whole day Briscoe was up to second early in the race um I had picked him actually to win in my one uh, game uh, I was borderline I had picked him already in the pick em deal so I ended up, end up going with Reddick and Reddick shits the bed. So um, that was the one time I decided to take the time I can get Tyler Reddick, and he ends up going and running bad. Um, but whatever. Uh, a lot to to really look at there, Josh. But in the end, Ryan Blaney, defending series champion, a couple weeks after a, um, a what should have been a win at Gateway, and uh, this time he goes and gets the dub in the advanced car in front of family on Father's Day. His dad's there, got the body armor to go and show my support for YRB, um, the real most popular driver, and uh, sold out crowd at Iowa Speedway. NBC comes back and did pretty damn good job. Um, it was just nice. It was a nice race to have on uh, Father's Day evening, for sure. Yeah. Great race uh, that we saw yesterday. I mean, pretty pretty interesting uh, things that happened through it. But yeah, Ryan Blaney goes out, gets his first win of the year, which, you know, with how his year has gone, how he ended last season being the champion, you're beginning to wonder how uh, or when would Ryan, Ryan Blaney win a race. And Penske hasn't been all that fast uh, throughout the year. You know, it's been mostly a Hendrick slash Toyota, uh, mostly Gibbs, uh, affair this year and it's you know been that kind of way throughout the whole year but you know Ford and Penske have started to pick it up within you know the last month or, or so of racing here and now Ryan Blaney you know who's had chances overall uh, of course a couple of weeks ago at Gateway like you said biggest opportunity for a win and literally um, goes up you know in, in uh, out out of the out of the win on the last lap but here, two weeks later at Iowa, gets the, a big victory here 
and vaults himself uh, from I think from eleventh to uh, sixth in the point standings. So um, yeah, a great uh, race that we saw yesterday. Um, and Ryan Blaney, of course, um, not only is this first win of the season, first win in the Iowa uh, Cup Series uh, history, but also you know it goes back to his first career win in NASCAR back in 2012. Uh, in the truck series with Brad Keselowski racing and he won there I think in 2015 with or 2013 with uh, uh, Team Penske and Xfinity as well so yeah the first three time uh, winner here uh, at Iowa across all three top NASCAR series so um, yeah so Ryan Blaney you know locks himself into the playoffs now so don't have to worry about that now and take more risks and go for continue to go for more wins uh, potentially throughout the you know remaining uh, nine races that we have left here in the uh, before the playoffs start, so uh, yeah, it's gonna be interesting. And you know, he definitely had a fast car, but you know, I think um, Ryan or uh, Kyle Larson definitely uh, had probably the better car throughout the entire race uh, up until he got into that accident uh, after stage two, and that kind of opened the door for uh, Ryan Blaney to go out and uh, win this race because I think Kyle Larson doesn't crash. I think it's probably a race between the two of them, but I think uh, Kyle Larson uh, probably ends up being the winner. He was, you know, had incredible pace and was able to go, you know, he pitted at one point uh, off schedule and was able to come back from that and make it into the top five uh, from the back of the field. So, um, you know, for all the worries about short track racing and how the next gen is handled, you know, at least even with the repave and, you know, concerns about how the tire was working and all that. Uh, Kyle Larson able to, uh, you know, slice and dice through the field. But, yeah, in the end, Ryan Blaney gets the win there. So, um, yeah, kind of breaks the, you know, trend of, you know, Chevy domination now, it seems like. I think Ford, you know, with Keselowski winning back in Darlington um, and Sindrick winning a few weeks ago in Gateway. And we saw uh, Joey Logano also win at the All-Star Race in North Wilkesboro, you know, it seems like maybe Ford's beginning to get some headway here uh, overall. So, you know, with Penske and uh, uh, RFK and a little bit of uh, front row with McDowell there. So, yeah, it seems like Ford overall uh, seems to be improving now as we get closer to the playoffs. So uh, might be interesting, you know, in the next couple of weeks, we see how they compare to Ford and and uh, she- or with uh, Ford teams and with, you know, Toyota and uh, Chevy teams, mostly Hendrick there. So, um, yeah, it should be interesting, but at least, you know, now we have a, um, bit of a difference here now, uh, in, uh, the playoff field with, uh, Ryan Blaney taking this win. And he gets himself solid because, you know, you don't want to put yourself in that position, um, to race and have to race in on points. You saw what we saw what happened to Martin Truex a couple of years ago. And it was him and Blaney racing for it at Daytona. And that was the year, a couple of years ago, where I think the whole entire field was yard sailed in turns one and two and that douchebag Austin Dillon won. Um, but they, both of them had been involved in separate incidents at one point. So, um, I mean, they even made a checkers or wreckers version of Blaney's car from that race or something. So... Um, in this case, though, uh, Ryan Blaney gets that win. He can now start focusing on acquiring more playoff points, trying to get more wins. Um, Jonathan Hassler was under fire two weeks ago. Now seems like a genius because he made the two tire call and Blaney was able to make it work. Um, as Josh mentioned, winning it all, winning in all three major NASCAR series at a track. That's something that is like, I think is um, something that Kyle Busch used, would basically do or Mark Martin. Well, not really been Mark Martin do it, but though he did win a lot of truck races that one year, he was in the truck series. But um, that was something like you'd probably see Kyle Busch do or um, I guess William Byron could do it too, to be fair, but. I'm trying to remember. There are guys that have won in all three series at a racetrack, but I, that's just something that is why or, or 
KFB, basically. But Ryan Blaney can go and say he's done it. So, um, that's oh, pretty cool. I mean, Bristol at least, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, he yeah. won at Bristol like 19,000 times, I think. So, when he was at Gibbs, especially. Um... I mean, that's, yeah, he talked about Larson. He still leads the points, but um, probably lost out on an opportunity there for a win. Hamlin, the off night, doesn't really pay for it. The racing was good, and we got to see a lot of it because NBC actually did a good job. Um, their production value and the way they directed the race was actually made sense. The announced trio, that was the original announcing trio. Um, yeah, they had some rust, but uh, it sounded kind of, you know, like what they had, what they were in the past. I mean, Latart wasn't a hundred percent, but he got better as the weekend went by. Burton was okay, um, and then you know, Rick Allen's Rick Allen. Uh, pit pit road uh, group. It's pretty good. I mean, you have, what, Snyder, um, Kimmy Kuhn, who I'll have no problem ever looking at her. And then um, I forget who else. Do they have somebody else like Dave Burns? Yeah, Dave Burns is down there, um, I believe, right? So those are the three pit, pit road people. And then usually they have Parker Kligerman, but I guess for whatever reason, even though he was there, he didn't work yesterday I because I never saw him yesterday. Um, and then you had, uh, DJ and Brad Doherty on the desk in the, in the infield there on, in pit road. And I think they honestly, and I said this in a tweet earlier, um, to skew car, I, I said that they should swap Jeff Burton and Dale Jarrett. And I think the broadcast would be even better because I don't really know. And I, Jeff Burton's been at this nearly a decade, and I still can't figure out what his purpose is in the booth. He was, I mean, he was like a squawking dog because Dale Jr. would go and go in his high-pitched voice and scream about everything, but Jeff Burton is just kind of meh, you know? It's kind of like his son in a cup car. Um, well... That, that's actually being kind to being what his son is in a cup car because his son sucks um, and isn't going to have a job next year. So, um, at least in cup. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the track, I mean, having Iowa Speedway on the cup series is good. I think the f crowd showing up is big. NASCAR, I mean, it's a market, it's an area. I mean, even though it's not like Iowa, like Iowa City or whatever. It's um it's an area that is um really wanting the sport and we are worried about short tracks. It doesn't really race like a short track. It does and it doesn't. Uh but at least it's a net positive to start the NBC portion of the season. Uh, coming up this weekend in New Hampshire, I think will be a good test uh of this package once again. Um, and these tires as well, since they have such, you know, hard braking going into the corners. I'm going to assume the shifting comes back this weekend at New Hampshire. So, um, there could be tire failures again because of the brake heat and this and the like. So, uh, the one, uh, one major a news story other than the tire issues and stuff that came up during uh, the practice and then what ended up uh, taking place to, throughout the race. But um, the big news was Martin Truex calling it quits. And um, whether, whatever reason you want to come up with, uh, I mean, whether he was forced, whether it was money, whether any Truex... Just saying he didn't, he wanted, he said no Moss, which Kenny Wallace essentially, that's the reason he gave on his, on his YouTube page. But whatever the reason is, 
Martin Truex is a Hall of Fame driver. You know, prior to like 2015, I don't think we would have said that. He would have been borderline um, because of the Xfinity. Um, there are guys that have made it in just based on their Xfinity careers. And Martin Truex, two-time champion, won good number of races, beat Kyle Busch the one year. And then I think the ne- the second year he won, he beat Clint Boyer uh, for the title. Um, amongst others, Denny Hamlin, um, you know, so he beat some good drivers that have been, that are in, at least in all of those cases, teammates of his. And then from 2015 on, he became, he started his Hall of Fame arc in the Cup Series. Now he's in the 30 plus win range. He's won, uh, uh multiple, uh, of the win, th- he hasn't. He hasn't won Talladega, right? He's never won a Talladega in a Cup car, which is interesting. Um, never won the 500, but he has won the 600. One of the biggest ass whoopings in the history of the Coca Cola 600 was delivered by Truex. If you go to Dover, you're more than likely going to see Truex win. So that unfortunate last time probably the last time we're probably going to see him though he did say that he wants to race 10 races next year i mean i don't know if he's watching what jimmy johnson's doing um but i'm not so sure recent than jimmy johnson yeah i i i guess and maybe it's just the way the car is it doesn't suit jimmy's style which i think makes a lot of sense um you know, Truex has been able to kind of assimilate and make this car work for his driving style. But it's interesting to see uh, probably 2311, if they're not um, expanding. Um, I do think they're going to expand anyways, which is something we'll discuss here in a moment. But, uh, I mean, for Martin Truex, I mean, he's, he's somebody who's, just been there he's been around for a while it's been 18 years 19 or 20 years if you really get all the way back to when he filled in for dale jr um with some of his uh, when he got hurt um i think he had a couple he had some injuries in 04 even though he had that was one of his best years of his career truex ended up going and getting in the car um, did so, I think, also in 05 once, and then also drove limited races, and then started his full-time cup career in 2006. Um, big-time rookie class that was. That was him and uh, Boyer, and um, I'm forgetting who the other one was, but it was, it was like, it felt like there was a bunch of big names, at least in the time. Uh, it was those two guys, and I think it was Reed Soren Suck, David Reckham's Tremmy. Paul um, Menard. Uh, yeah, no, Paul no, no. Menard. Paul Menard no, was the year that, after. He, he, yeah, started, yeah. he started racing in Cup, but that was, that was the year after. Um, um, yeah, I, yeah. 2006. I, I'm going to go look, look up uh, who was uh, 2006 NASCAR. David Tremmy. Reed Sorensen, Denny Hamlin, J.J. Yaley. Yeah, J.J. Uh, Yaley was driving the 18 car. That's the, that's, and Dennis Hamlin was a rookie too. Denny there Gare. you go. Yeah. Yeah. So Denny Hamlin became the driver of the 11, which obviously he's driven his entire career. Um, yeah. So there, there was a lot of guys that, uh, came up there. J.J. Yaley replacing Bobby Labonte. So Tony Stewart was the elder statesman on the team. At that point, uh, Boyer joining Kevin Harvick and Jeff Burton at uh, RCR after he ran the Xfinity Series. Um, Cheap Ganassi having two rookies, and then Casey Mears was a pretty bad uh, decision. Um I forgot Brent Sherman was a rookie that year. Made probably because he sucked. Um, David Gilland. Yeah, that was the year that you're showing it. Today was the anniversary 
um, 18 years since he won that Xfinity race at Kentucky randomly in a like a limit or whatever that team that he was driving for. And I think like a few weeks later, he ends up getting the 38 ride M&M's car with Robert Yates racing from uh, Elliot Sadler, who then moved over to um, Everham Motorsports uh, the last 14 races of the year, replacing Jeremy Mayfield. Um, because Jeremy Mayfield basically um, uh, napalmed himself because he called uh, that douchebag Rick Ray Everham out on the fact that he was fucking around with uh, Aaron Crocker. Um, little did we know they'd end up becoming husband and wife and making more kids, so there you go. Um, and you know, Jeremy Mayfield would have quite a interesting... Uh, Sub post script to his uh, racing career there. Um, I mean, he's still racing, but it was pretty crazy what happened with him. Oh, Chad Chaffin was a was a, considered a rookie, and oh man, wow, Chad Chaffin, the the longtime Xfinity and Truck Series driver there. Yeah, okay. The point is, Martin Drex is calling it quits, Josh. Um, it is a loss. One of the veterans. Uh, one of the last connections, really, to the next style era, really, um, right when um, and the BZF starting, you know, taking over, essentially. Um, he's been solid. He's an interesting guy. He definitely gets wound up. But he's a pretty relatively laid back dude, understated. But he won races. He had a habit of winning um, races in dominating fashion. I think it's interesting how Ryan Blaney kind of carries himself in a lot of ways and drives. Uh, has a lot of those same characteristics, though he's just he's got a little more of a personality. But you know, I think there's a lot of driving similarities between him and Martin Truex Jr. Um, both of them, of course, being cup champions. So um, MTJ calling it a day. Um, but we're, I mean, we've been hearing it for a while. I think they've been forcing the storyline down our throat. It's been on the cards for at least two years. They've been talking about this. Um, when Sherry Pollux, when he was still with Sherry, that and her, you know, cancer and all that, that maybe he'd call it quits, didn't. Now he wants to go and kind of set off and um, figure out the next steps of his life in his early 40s. Um, what were your thoughts on uh, the announcement that took place on Friday, Josh? I mean, yeah, not surprised for sure there because, yeah, we've already been hearing rumors about it last year, whether he would retire or come back for uh, another year. Um you know, uh, everything seemed like, oh, this could be his last year in Cup, and yeah, sure enough, Martin Truex retiring at the end of the season, so um, not surprising, really, but uh, now it's official, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's a great loss for the series, you know, he's definitely a, a driver that, you know, races kind of the old school way, very respectful uh, on the racetrack, not uh, someone that, you know, does a lot of uh, aggressive uh, Nis, like what we you know have seen from some of the younger drivers, um, so yeah, definitely kind of a loss from there. I mean, uh, go back to you know how he came up in this series, you know, with the family team in the uh, the Bush North uh, series and all that, and kind of how he's driven. Of course, the first driver that was ever successful for uh, Dale Jr. with uh, Chance to uh, winning back to back in uh, the Bush series back in the day. So um, yeah, it was definitely a you know, great driver uh, throughout the years. Although you know, he went to DEI in the Cup Series, definitely uh, that was on the tail end of DEI. So we never really got to see how good he was there. And then, of course, you know, going to uh, Michael Waltrip Racing uh, in 2010, um, it never really got to see how good he was there either. I mean, you could kind of see it in some points, but you know, there was a lot of inconsistency uh, over over there. 
uh, until uh, you know 2013. Of course, uh, the loser of the uh, I guess scandal from uh, 2013 and kind of the end of the road for him with Napa, but you know get, goes to uh, Furniture Row and rebuilds his career there, and then all of a sudden just starts winning, especially you know when they partnered up with Joe Gibbs and Toyota. So um, then I think you know we finally got to see you know, what Martin Truex Jr. was actually made of uh, in this series and started seeing him contend for championships year after year, uh, you know, well well into his, you know, mid-30s, which, you know, uh, seems a bit unusual, but, you know, it seems like these days the driver's prime is in their, you know, late late 30s, early 40s in NASCAR. So, um, you know, performance kind of started to uh, drift off, you know, after, uh, I think, probably after 2021, I think is you know, when he last made the championship four, um, you know, especially in next gen era started to kind of drop off there. So, uh, yeah, Martin, Martin Truex, you know, still one of the solid veterans here in the series, but yeah, I think for me, I think, you know, knowing that he was going to retire soon, um, and the presence of recently retired drivers, of course, you know, Dale Jr. Of course, presence in the media, still, you know, races time to time Xfinity, um, junior motorsports owner and all that stuff. Jeff Gordon's, you know, trans transition from the broadcast booth, uh, to being executive vice president, Jimmy Johnson, you know, went to IndyCar and now is the, uh, owner of legacy motors, motor club or part owner there. You know, Tony Stewart's still been around, although they're exiting the sport, uh, and all that. So, you know, all these drivers that, you know, from that era, you know, from the mid two thousands have all figured out something, how to stay in the sport for the most part. Um, you know, Harvick in the broadcast booth, etc. So Truex, you know, he's not a really somebody that, you know, would stay in the media. He doesn't really have that presence. You know, he doesn't own a race team. So, you know, I thought maybe when he would announce his retirement, you know, he'd probably be the guy that would, you know, go disappear, you know, off the face of the earth, you know, in front of the sport, kind of like what Carl Edwards did and go do his own thing, go fish or go do whatever. So um wasn't sure if he, he would go try, like, you know, short track racing, you know, in the, I guess, Northeast or something kind of like, you know, when he made his living before he got up to the Bush series. So, um, you know, that was kind of what I was thinking, but it was a little surprising that there could be some part-time uh, deals on, on the line with uh, 2311 and Denny Hamlin or, you know, Joe Gibbs or something like that. So, uh, you know, at least the Daytona 500 on the table as a part-timer, next year for Truex. So I guess he still gets to stay in the sport somehow, but at a reduced uh, schedule. And I guess uh, whenever he wants to, and I guess in the meantime, he can go hunt and fish uh, all he wants to with uh, bash pro shops there. So um, yeah, we'll see what else he does, but, but yeah, definitely a, you know, very huge presence, you know, quiet, quiet guy on the racetrack too. You know, we don't really, um, yeah, on and off the racetrack. So, you know, you don't really see, notice him until he's there and he's, you know, dominating and winning and all that. So, um, you know, we've seen him over the years come, you know, become a great driver of the series. And yeah, so definitely, uh, definitely going to be missed for sure. Yeah. And I mean, you brought up certain, you brought up a lot of those names from the mid 2000s. <clears throat> and it's been a trend. Basically it started with Jeff, Jeffy, in 2015 and then like every year we've had somebody retire uh from that era i mean jeffy is different but still he's one of the greatest of all time you had smoke in 16 you had junior in 17 you had i mean you've had edwards um you know we we're trying to go through I mean, now Harvick recently, and then um, you got Truex here. Basically, like the Gillette Young Guns. I mean, Kurt Busch, of course, having to retire because of his injuries. I mean, basically, all of the Gillette Young Guns are out of the sport now, uh, are going to be out of the sport full time. Um, you have, yeah, I'm trying to, like, Candy Cane races in the High Limit Sprint Car Series, you know, like. It's crazy to think all day they had all that marketing back in like 2004 when Nextel came in. Um, 
and all these guys that were the uh, that were basically the core of the series uh, for the future. While all of you know, you had the veterans that were basically at the end of the line, uh, so to speak. You had you know Terry, you had Terry Labonte and DJ and um, Elliot and. Um, actual William Clyde Elliott, um, you know, those guys and basically being around the end of their career. And then you had these guys that were in the peak at their, um, uh, they were peaking. So that, that's, uh, interesting. That was the, when the playoff system, the chase started and stuff like that. So there's been a lot of change in the last 20 years and, that's another driver that comes back as one of the last connections to DEI as well. Like you mentioned, I mean, one of the last connections to DEI, Chance 2, all that. Um, you know, so it's it's a loss um, for sure for the sport. Uh, somebody who had, I mean, he didn't really, you know, raise his voice a whole lot, but when he did, you had to listen. Um, so when it came to stuff, once he got out of the car, I mean, I think he just permanently bitched when he's in the car and he still does, but we'll see what happens with him. Um, the, that car has probably been the most interesting, um, in this silly season. I mean, the SHR deal for charters basically being put on the market have, have kind of changed things up. One is sold for sure to front row, um, but you have four drivers and a bunch of team members and stuff that are on deck, and the the overarching rumor, and it's something like uh, we've talked about in our text chain with uh, um, former guest and and contributor and friend Joe Passero where we're talking about who could get in a 19 car and it looks like Chase Briscoe is going to be the guy which Briscoe has been with Ford uh his entire career going back to Arca when Arca was actually a series um uh, the you know so that was with Cunningham Motorsports driving for Ford. Then he drove for Brad. Ended up having to do like a in between year where he was driving all different kinds of cars. Um, after the sixty RF case or the Roush sixty car disaster that involved that had him, Gumby Sindrick and uh, Ty Majeski in that car. Um, the fact that any of them still have a career is amazing after that, but they all have had careers. And, um, for me, of course, as a Briscoe fan, there's, I, I've already came out and said until there's actually an official announcement and they show like a Mahindra tractors 19 or whatever, hopefully they change it and bring back the 18 personally. I'm a... I come from when Gibbs was just a one car team and it was the 18 car. I'd rather have the 18 car out there. The 19 car never really did anything for me. Um, they had it because of Aris and they were able to uh, use Suarez as a way to get that in there and then got Carl Edwards in the process. But, um, or Carl, I, I, I forget how the angle was. Was Carl, yeah. They somehow or another got Carl Edwards away from Ford, and then Suarez jumped in the car after. Yeah, that's what it was, yeah. Suarez jumped in the car for a few years, and then they ran him out the door the way they run certain guys out the door at Gibbs. But that's my concern, I think, also. You know, when you are when you you have that car, and then you have Hamlin, you have Christopher Bell, who definitely is... I think the the future, and then of course Keebler, who is a talented race car driver, he's a midget and he's a douche, but he's a talented race car driver, um, and the grandson of the guy who owns a team. You're going to be fourth. 
your fourth string right off the bat. Um, the deal with Truex, he, uh, Gibbs went and ran Barney Visser out of uh, business and uh, basically took Martin, the sponsorship, Cole Pern and company and brought him over. Um, now you're going to have Chase Briscoe coming out of the Ford camp, coming out of SHR, and essentially for um, outside of 22 when he had really good race cars and could have won six, seven races that year, I think. Um, you know, and definitely, I mean, of course, dominated Phoenix was in position, had a chance to win a lot more races, um, finishing the top 10 in points. I mean, it's you, it will be a huge step up, um, and a lot of expectations on him, a lot of pressure on him. Um, because the, I think the initial rumor was for Briscoe that he was going to go and drive the 21 car, which, you know, essentially is a fourth Penske car. I think the, it's a, at, you know, if they put the effort in, meaning they put a little more money into it, I think that car could be a slight, definitely a slight improvement. But the way that it's run the last three years, at best, it's a lateral move. So I get why that wouldn't be an ideal scenario. Um, I always will will stay with the fact that they should have never made Blaney leave. They should have just made it essentially that, you know, given it all the Penske, whatever stuff they needed to, but he fit that car to a T. Um, and he fit the, fa like, with the family and all that. And they could have had somebody else driving the 12 car because it's, they already have Gumby driving the two to no man's land anyway. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of moving parts here. I mean, we haven't heard Spire, of course, they, um, I mean, Trackhouse has to get another charter, um, you know, for SVG. Uh, and then who knows what it looks like Zane Smith may be out the door. One minute he was going to track house and now he might be out the door after this year. Um you got guys on in Fords like Kerbst who brings money. You have Cole Custer, you have um you know other guys in uh Chevy and, and Toyota camps that probably don't have as many options, uh, you know, and then you got the woods, you got the um, two two front row motorsports cars. It sounds like Josh Berry, you know, it, the scenarios, Josh Berry goes over and takes over the 34 car um, and brings Rodney with him, Rodney Childers. I find that interesting in the sense that Travis Peterson has done a really good job there. Um, would they go and just say, hey, we're going to move you over to the new charter, new charter, we'll give you Zane Smith or whatever. I don't know who it'll be, probably be Zane Smith, I would think, um, because he was already there at Front Row Motorsports. I don't know how it ended in terms of if it was amicable. I mean, obviously, it came up pretty quick. That it went from, you know, he's going to be in an FRM car, he could probably be in the 38, to I'm out the door going to track house, and I'm going to have a, a whatever year, um, a fill year with um, Spire, and it's been a unmitigated disaster um, on a week-to-week -week basis. They're one of the shittiest cars on the racetrack. Um, Zane Smith looks out of depth and he's a really talented race car driver so is it him is it the cars i mean spire is not a great race team I, to be fair i mean they've never really been great in cup in trucks yes they're fine because it's basically kyle bush motorsports uh you have talent you have really talented people there and you have really good race car drivers Carson Osevar is a talented driver. Zane Smith is a talented driver. Um, but the cars aren't good. Um, Corey LaJoy is 
more of a talker. Um, uh, he's he than than an actual driver. Uh, he, if he was a crew chief, I think he'd be way more successful uh, than him being a driver. But he goes out there and drives, so whatever. Um, I guess the check's clear, so even if you suck, it doesn't really matter. Um, but, I mean, there's a lot of rumors going on, Josh, and um, I don't know, there might be some guys coming out of Xfinity. I mean, there's a lot of them guys that have money, Chandler Smith being one of them, uh, Creed, um, Dumbo Hill, uh, but I think he's connected to RCR for a while, so he's probably going to stay there, and he fits the bill for an RCR driver. Um, you know, Jesse Love right now has that uh, Whelan sponsorship, but then they, they're they connected with RCR as well. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts going on here. Um, Corey Heim is in play. Um, considering what's, what you're... What, You've heard, um, I was putting out a bunch of different scenarios. I mean, the Chase Briscoe one, I guess that's the one we should talk about. Since it is Martin Truex um, leaving, um, does is, is it the right call for Gibbs to go with Briscoe? Or is there somebody else out there that they're overlooking? Would they have the money or sponsorship to go and support another driver or is it a sponsor driven decision with the potential for it to be uh, a good solid hire and that's the reason why they're going with chase briscoe i think for chase briscoe i mean first of all he's already been in the cup series for a good while now so um this would be an upgrade for him uh, I mean, let's be honest, it'd be an upgrade for him to go into the 19, which, you know, still a playoff caliber team uh, there and not, you know, quite on the same level right now. Uh, but it would definitely be an upgrade for him. Um, they getting a experienced cup veteran uh, who's, you know, been in on the tour for, you know, quite a while now and has experience with the next gen rather than bringing up a rookie who will have probably a year or two of, you know, experience before he's really good uh, in the Cup Series. Um, and, you know, he also has the uh, sponsorship, you know, potentially maybe from Mahindra. Maybe Tony can help him out and convince Bass Pro Johnny Morris that uh, they can sponsor uh, Chase Briscoe uh, or stay on with the 19 and sponsor Chase Briscoe. You know, they're already sponsoring a bunch of different guys uh, in the Cup Series, including Martin Truex, but potentially bring in uh, Chase Briscoe into that fold so there's that um, and it would make make a lot of sense you know for uh, Briscoe just to from that end because you, you know with Mahindra but you know bringing over there uh, and potentially you know Bass Pro Shops possibly staying on you know there's also the other sponsors that they have uh, alongside Bass Pro with uh, auto owners insurance I think interstate batteries so there's potential there for um the sponsors to continue on in the uh the 19 car but they could also consolidate into the other programs as well with joe gibbs so um yeah i think briscoe i mean it would it would be definitely a big move i think and definitely uh right now you know versus you know sheldon creed or chandler smith i don't know if they're quite ready to go up to uh the cup series and uh race uh you know, with uh, Joe Gibbs, so definitely I don't think Sheldon Creed's ready. I mean, Chandler Smith could be, but I feel like maybe another year uh, in the, you know, Xfinity series and everything. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how the rest of the rides play out, especially with, you know, how uh, the Joe Gibbs, or, you know, with Joe Gibbs filling in this seat and then also Stuart Haas, uh, what becomes the rest of the charters, like you said, and possibly some of them being picked up by other teams and how, how does this all work out? So, um, of course, the other fact of the matter is that they're still ongoing in the charter discussions, and how does that affect the amount of charters a team gets from here on out? And 
of course, seems like what we're hearing is that Hendrick and Gibbs get grandfathered in while the rest of the teams uh, still keep only three charters uh, maximum. And uh, whether those charters are rented out or uh, they're permanent and each team actually owns them uh, and everything. So we'll see. We'll see how that works and how you know all these seats get filled. But you know, potentially one of the pieces here, I think, you know, the rumor is I think that next week they'll possibly announce that uh, based on what we're hearing on social media for uh, the 19th. So possibly one of the first uh, seats getting filled in for next year in the aftermath of Martin Truex's retirement and the aftermath of Stuart Haas announcing their shutter um, closing down at the end of the year. So um, that's definitely uh, something we're going to have to look forward to hearing about more in the next coming weeks. Yeah, that's it's going to be something I, I figured. I mean, they wouldn't be able to hold it back, um, you know, past, you know, going to the break or go to getting to Indy. It probably would have been big for them to be able to hold it out long enough for it to get to Indy because he's a he's an Indiana boy. They're going back for the Brickyard 400. Um, you know, I think and they announced the Mahindra deal at Indianapolis as well, but I guess, you know, Nashville's a good place also to go and make that call. I mean, also at Briscoe, he brings Highpoint, uh, dot com, High Point Solutions, and, uh, yeah, I mean, those are the two main ones. Um, you can't bring one of them, because that's obviously board sponsor, um, but, uh, some of them sponsors were SHR, so who knows? Maybe they'd be willing to come around, come over with them too. So then, between that and maybe the notion of Bass Pro staying with him or staying with 19 Car versus, say, going with Gagson, or um, which seems to be the rumor, um, wherever he's gonna go or whatever, that might be um, an interesting thing, a good combination of sponsors. That wouldn't be an issue for JGR there, and that might help um, Briscoe out um, in his hopes to um, get, you know, get more, get through that wall that has kind of existed for him um, with the wins and... um, being able to close the deal. So yeah, we might, you know, see that next couple of weeks there. That'll be Nashville um leading into July the fourth weekend. But um Xfinity Zero, let's go and do the points. Sorry, let's go and do the points. The ten what is it, ten drivers have won so far this year. Blaney uh, moves himself up to seventh based on getting a win um he's not uh, in terms of actual point standing is blaney oh so blaney is seventh anyway uh in points but he's also seventh in the playoff grid no larson leads the points by or no Elliot actually leads the points uh, by, what is it, eight over Larson. Then you have um, Hamlin, Byron, so all the three-time winners so far this year. Uh, And Tyler Reddick, Ryan Blaney, or Truex, Tyler Reddick. So all them Toyotas are basically up there. Pretty exception of Gibbs and um, Baba right now, but all the Toyotas at the moment are the four Gibbs and two uh, 2311 cars are all in the uh, playoff as of now. Uh, point either through wins or through points. Ford, uh, as Josh mentioned, you got Penske and you have. Uh, RFK with Brad Keselowski. So, and you, right now, for the exception of Joey Logano, Busher right now is in points wise. But the finishes, you'd have to get some more consistency for sure. 
um, to guarantee himself into the playoff. Uh, Trackhouse has both of their drivers in. Um, Hendrick has, or, I mean, three of them have already won, and Bowman has been relatively consistent. So um, it's very um, saturated by uh, only a handful of teams, uh, essentially. Uh, you count Toyota as one thing. It's basically with the 2311 cars, so that would be six of those, and then you have the Hendra cars, and that's four, plus track house, that's another six. And then you have the four Fords, which is the Penske's, um, or the two Penske Fords, and then Brad Keselowski out there, uh, and then who am I forgetting there? And Busher, yeah. So the two RFK and two Penske cars. Logano right now is out by six points. Um, Bush with the issues he had yesterday falls uh, thirty-one points behind uh, Darrell Walls Jr. And then. Briscoe, who was running way better than what he ended up finishing, uh, lost points and fell uh, 21 and 41, 44 points back. And then Todd Gillen right now rounds out the top 20. The Xfinity Series ran the High V Perks 250 at Iowa Speedway. The winner uh, was was uh, Sam Mayer. Um, Chandler Smith won both stages, led the most laps, uh, but in the end, Sam Mayer gets the victory over Riley Herbst, Corey Heim, driving for Sam Hunt, Sammy Smith, the Iowa native, in fourth, Sheldon Creed in fifth, Cole Custer sixth, Matt DiBurrito, Seventh, Smith, Chandler Smith there. Um, Ross Chastain driving for DGM Racing. And uh, Daniel Dye. I think he was running a Miller Genuine Draft Rusty Wallace throwback uh, of sorts at Iowa Speedway. So that's um, cool by them. Uh, they went to overtime as well. Um what was it, 17 cars on the lead lap? David Starr was the last car on the lead lap. That's something. Um, Kligerman, Ryan Sieg, Leland Honeyman, Ryan Ellis, Anthony Alfredo, Joey Gase. The David Starr were the cars on the lead lap. Brett Moffitt was actually driving for Gibbs. Finished 18th. Um, did score stage points in the first stage. You have... Allgaier, who got wrecked, um, laid your part of the race, got stage points in both stages. Um, you had uh, John Hunter Nemechek led 35 laps, but he also got wrecked. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, really, you had Chandler Smith and Sam Mayer dominate uh, essentially 170 was 178 laps of the races, 253. Then you had uh, John Hunter and Allgaier, and then a bunch of like a handful of others there. But um, Chandler Smith led early, but when uh, push came to shove, Sam Mayer gets uh, his. Sixth win of his career, and what was his, his uh, third of this season, so um, or second of this season. So I don't even know. I, I don't really care. Sam Mayer, but um, Mayer gets that one, uh, solidifies himself uh, in the playoff. If it was really much of a discussion anyway, I think he was probably going to make it no matter what, but yeah, it actually was his second win of the year. Okay, there you go. 
So, um, yeah, so that's the deal there. And, I mean, Sam Mayer having a battle, um, showing a little bit of moxie in there, um, going and getting that victory, outlasting Riley Herbst, Josh, and um, others to go and get that victory on the new Iowa um, surface there. A great restart there for at the end of the race there for Sam Mayer and um you know shows Sam Mayer is able to get the job done if he puts him in the right opportunity there and being up there up front um goes out and gets a good restart and, and wins wins the race. So um interestingly enough, you know, a guy from Junior Motorsports wins the first Xfinity race back since they uh, had the hiatus and how the first ever Xfinity race at Iowa won by a Jim Motorsports guy and Brad Keselowski there. So very interesting. But yeah, I like this shot at the end. I think a lot of people did too of after the win. Um, Mayer is doing his burnout. And then you also have the second cutaway screen of uh, Riley Herbst looking onward on, on the racetrack there. And you know, nothing about rivalry or anything like that, but just the the shot of him just looking on, seeing him celebrate. I think that was, you know, one of the things uh, I think NBC does well is how they cultivate the storylines uh, post race and uh, throughout. So yeah, it's definitely another uh, good bit of coverage there that they did well um, in their return uh, to covering the series. But uh, yeah, that was, uh, you know, of course, Mayer is able to go out and uh, solidify himself in the playoffs there. So, um, good job for him, I guess. Um, but you know, there was a bit of argy bargy, I think with, uh, John Hunter Nemechek and, uh, Sheldon Creed there at the end. Um, and Nemechek ends up crashing out of the race late and, uh, that kind of led it up into the, you know, the final, uh, moments there with, uh, the final restart. So, um, that led to the opportunity for Sam Mayer, uh, grabbing the win there. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, my pick with, Chandler Smith, of course, I mean, I said Chandler Smith would go out and be dominant there, and, I mean, he was, so um, just wasn't up front there at the end. But, um, yeah, uh, good, I think, yeah, good race. I think kind of showed a preview of what the Cup Series would end up being uh, looking like uh, on Sunday there with, yeah, the Xfinity Series showing lot, lots of uh, action throughout the field and passing, you know, passing throughout the field. So, um yeah, it was a, definitely a good race there. Of course, uh, Shane Van Gensenberg wanting to uh, have a good start there after going back-to-back, of course, and uh, ends up having a bad day, crashing out uh, and everything. So I think he just had a bad weekend overall, so unable unable to really capitalize on those two wins. So we'll have to see how he does here faring, you know, going forward with... Uh, his uh i guess performance on oval tracks and everything as we know we know what he can do on road courses there so yeah it was a definitely definitely a solid race there saturday you know good ending there with uh sam air getting the win yeah i mean uh for him getting that second win makes him the fourth driver in this series to have two wins so far this season. Um, right now you have four, six different winners uh, that are running the full schedule. So um, Cole Custer leads the points by one over Chandler Smith. Uh, but Chandler Smith ends up, I think he's, yeah, he's tied with all guy or for the same amount of playoff points. Um, Austin Hills minus 41, Justin Allgaier is minus 44. So it's definitely nowhere near done here in their regular season. Four driver race for that. Um, Love and Creed, Love, Creed, and Riley Herbst are all clustered together. Then you have Almondinger, Kligerman, Sam Mayer, um, separated by what? Uh, 14 points. Sammy Smith and Shane Van Gisbergen uh, rounding out the 12. And so that's the overall, that's the overall top 12. Then you go and show the, yeah, and it's 
30 points between Sammy Smith and Ryan Sieg, or 31 points. Um, he, yeah. And then uh, minus 54 is Anthony Alfredo, and minus 74 is Brockshot Jones. So that's the uh, points they're going um, from Iowa going to New Hampshire this coming weekend. I'll spend a brief amount of time on uh, the U.S. Open uh, Father's Day tradition, uh, the U.S. Open uh, golf. Yeah, so um, Bryson DeChambeau becomes a two-time U.S. Open champion, uh, become, continues his whole um, uh, Captain America arc that he's trying to push and pull off. and. Um, it was a tough round. It wasn't uh, very uh, clean or a uh, great driving round for Bryson DeChambeau. He spent most of his time in the uh, in the native areas, and um, you know, so that's uh, yeah. Well, there you go, Liberty Corner. You have four point three mil. Well, I mean, it's not like he needs it. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, Neil Shipley, who becomes the first Ohio State golfer to win the uh, top amateur award at the uh, U.S. Open since some guy named Jack Nicklaus. Um, he also won low am at uh, the Masters. Uh, I mean, with the, this at the end of the day, he ends up plus one. Uh, Shooting seventy one, um, Rory McIlroy at one point was I think was really yeah he had gotten it all the way to four five yeah he was at plus, minus four um, after thirteen holes and was leading the championship um, by two shots. And then proceeded to go plus three in the last five, which included bogeys on 15, 16, and 18. Uh, 15 was a missed club, and he went over the green. Uh, 16, I'm trying to remember... If that one was the second shot, or he got himself in the native area there. Um, I'm trying to remember that one offhand, but I can't. Um, 18, he drove it into the native area and got a bad, drew a bad lie, um, and um, had a short one. He had short putts both at 15 and 18, missed both of them, and um, he just can't make and then it was in on the fifth hole he drew a bad break uh should have it should have been way better and if he had he he gets a par there he's in the he's in a playoff even with the implosion that he had but um i mean in the grand scheme of things bryson shot even on the back plus one on the front he was a cleaner on the scorecard, even though his driving was terrible. Uh, he was able to put himself in spots that he needed to to get the job done. Um, after you know his first his tee shots, usually ending up in the native area, he was very lucky um, at times to uh, get away with that. So. I mean, uh, that's uh, the way you have. Sometimes you have to get lucky to win these tournaments, but it's better, some, or sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Um, Bryson had had a solid week, shooting three rounds in the 60s um, prior to uh, Sunday. So, you know, to shoot six under par on a course as difficult as Piner's number two, uh, for four days is really good. And um, Rory, though, will be left wondering 
for sure. Shot 65 to start the tournament. Uh, was in a tie with Patrick Cantlay. Who is who he was playing with. Um, that could have played a role because of how slow Patrick Cantlay is. I felt like Rory McIlroy was going slower than he usually does. I don't know if that made any difference. Um, on the one hand, he, for 13 holes, he looked really great. And then once he got that lead, then I don't know, something changed. And um, he wasn't himself anymore. Now, Finau had uh, Tony Finau finished T3 with Cantley. Cantley struggled with irons, struggled on the greens. McElroy was bad with his irons. Um, and his putting deserted him late, which those are two recipes for disaster. Um, Matthew Pavone, who played in the final group, also shot plus one. Um, Hideki Matsuyama shot even. It could have been way better. Henley was minus three uh, today. It could have been better. Xander Shoffley, the PGA champion, comes back at the U.S. Open and is one of eight players who finishes under par. Sam Burns has his best round, or ties his best round uh, of the week with a three under 67, and Davis Thompson rounds up top 10. Yeah, Ludwig Obear um, was in great position um, at five under par going into the weekend and then proceeded to shoot six over uh, the weekend. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, that's that. Akshay Batia, you know, we have him and, you know, some of these other ones, Colin Morikawa. You know, a lot of battles there for Canadians in terms of trying to get, make the Olympics. Bruce Kepka, former U.S. Open champion. Uh, really couldn't get it all together this whole week. Uh, you have, yes, Sahith Tagala shot 77 and basically shot himself out of the tournament because he was even par for three rounds uh, the from rounds two through four and shot seven over uh, on the first day or else he probably would have been in the top ten situation there so Jordan Spieth shot 71 uh, uh, Zayas uh, Clark the defending US Open champion uh, finished uh, with a 77 in the final round wasn't the worst round uh, Sonyeon Kim shot 83 uh, I'm trying to go through some of the other ones. A lot of a uh, couple overs, three overs. Um, so yeah, I mean, for Rory, what is he gonna do after blowing uh, the U.S. Open uh, win? There uh, is something we're gonna have to see. Um, for Bryson, he handled himself relatively well and he was able to have the crowd with him i mean rory had the crowd with him too but um bryson was working the crowd like he was a pro wrestler and uh seemed to work pretty good for him in general so we'll see what happens it's another signature event this coming week at uh, the travelers in cromwell connecticut so all these big names will be there. Rory will be there as well. Um, so we'll see um, how that all goes. Uh, get into the GSP roundup. We'll start with the results of the 24 hours of Lama, which um, I'm trying to look for the yeah the results. So yeah, the AF course of Ferrari number fifty of Antonio Fuco, Miguel Molina, and Nicholas Nielsen 
get the victory by 14.2 seconds over the number seven Toyota, Jose Maria Lopez, Kamui Kobayashi, and Nick DeVries. So that's, uh, yeah, you have the former Formula E world champion Nick DeVries, Jose Maria Lopez was called in because um, I think Anthony Davidson got hurt, so they needed a fill in there. Uh, the Ferrari number 51 defending race winners of Alexander Perguidi, James Collado, Antonio Giovinazzi round out the podium. Uh, there were six, there were actually nine cars that were on, uh, hypercars that are on the lead lap at the end of the race. You had, you had, uh, you had the two Ferraris, and you had the two Porsche Penske's in fourth and sixth, both Toyotas. Um, in the so three teams in the top six. Then you had the Cadillac racing uh, Ganassi car in seventh, and then the two Jota Sport cars um, running there in the uh, eighth and ninth. Um, two laps down was the Iron Lynx, number 63, rounding out the top 10 there. Um, in LMP2, the United Autosports team of Oliver Jarvis, Bejoy Garg, and Nolan Siegel, uh, the one that looks like Gilbert Gottfried but definitely has a lot of money, gets a victory over the defending champion Inter Europol with Schmikowski, Lomko, and Clement Novalak. And the IDEC Sport, number 28, with uh, Job Van Waitert and a couple other guys i never heard of. And then in the um, LMGT3 category, saw Manti, EMA, Porsche with Shahin, Sherling and Richard Leitz get the win over um, the, yeah, that's the other two. Yeah, so you have, or the Team WRT BMW number 31 with Leung, Sean Galeal, and Augusto Farfis. And then the Proton Competition Mustang of Rhoda, Peterson, Dennis Olsen. Uh, rounding out the podium there. The Iron Dames finished fifth in class. So, good run by them. I mean, when you look at some of the teams that had uh, a misfortune, you had the uh, Alpines, both Alpines fell out, both BMWs fell out. So, that's uh, some of their, one of the Porsches, the Penske Porsches fell out as well. So, and then the AF Corsa, the AF Corsa number eighty-three of uh, Ye Yefe, Schwartzman, and Kubica got wrecked by BMW. The second Cadillac from Ganassi with Bourdais, Van der Zanda, and Scott Dixon had issues. So, and so that's. Uh, the um, there's a crowd strike car by racing my APR with um, George Kurtz, Colin Brown, Nikki Katzberg coming from IMSA. Uh, they got an uh, they got the invite for their win in the class, um, but unfortunately had issues there. Uh, supercars, Darwin Triple Crown. Uh, We'll go to the race results in uh, race one. Saw Brock Feeney get the victory over Mark Winterbottom and teammate Will Brown. Uh, James Golding and Chaz Mostert round out the top five. Chevy's had seven of the top eight uh, spots. And, um, yeah, so Fords that were in the top 10, Moster in 5th, Di Pasquale, Anton Di Pasquale in ninth, and Cam Waters in 10th. Of course, if you remember, Will Brown and Cam Waters ran at Snoroma a couple weeks ago. 
Um, and then in race two, Feeney gets the double along with um, Will Brown. So a Red Bull uh, triple eight uh, battle there. And Brody Kostecki, the defending series champion, gets the podium. James Golding, another top five, along with Nick Percat and Jack LeBrock. So top six were all Chevys. Uh, before you had three Fords, both Dick Johnson Racing Mustangs and then Richie Stanaway for Penwright Racing. Um, go to the standings um, right now. Uh, Will Brown leads the points by just over 100, uh, 108 over Brock Feeney, Chaz Mostert in third. Um, then a really tight race between Nick Percat, Golding, Waters, Davidson, uh, which is 42 points between those four drivers. Uh, then World Superbikes at Misano. Oh, that's big news. Um, shut down Kawasaki, shuts down factory world superbike team at the end of 2024 so yeah that's a big uh big loss um after the dominance of johnny ray and uh, for many years so that's uh interesting um uh, uh, this weekend at misano was a double uh win for topak toprak rascat lioku and bmw uh, beats the Ducati teammates Bolega and Bautista um, in race one. Andrea Locatelli and Alex Lowe's uh, round out the top five. Uh, you have Garrett Gerloff was 12th. I'm trying to see some of these other... Uh, yeah, and then um, Johnny Ray was wrecked off um on the opening lap and there's a few other one dnfs there's four total uh then in the super pole race rasco rascalioku got the complete sweep um over belega and lowes locatelli ian known uh axel bassani Iker lacuona johnny ray danilo petrucci and dominique argeter uh, rounding out the top 10 there. And then in race two, Rascalioku over Belega and Bautista again. Then Alex Lowe's, Andrea Locatelli around the top five, Danilo Petrucci, Axel Bassani, Remy Gardner, um, Iker Lacuona, and then Johnny Ray rounding out the top 10. The standings. Uh, see Toprak Raskagliuku after his big weekend uh, take the points lead by 21 over Belega and um, uh, 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 yeah so 24 points ahead of Alvaro Bautista and then there's a huge gap to Alex Lowe's in fourth Andre Locatelli um, rounding out the top five Jared Gerloff right now is 13th in points. He's actually ahead of Johnny Ray by two and behind of Sam Lowe's by one. So um, room to move up. Argeter is 14 points ahead in 10th. All right, so the six hours at the Glen this coming weekend. Um, get into the entry list for the six hours. There, six hours at the Glen. Scroll all the way down. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, 11 GTP, 13 LMP2s, um, 11 GTD Pro, and 21 GTD cars. So that's a huge uh, entry list. 56 cars will be out there this weekend. Um, you bring back the bring back the 
guys that were over and Europe, Europe, and then like Renger Van de Zanden and Sebastian Bourdais, um, Penske Porsche guys, Dane Cameron was left out. So he'll be rested. BMW RLL. You have the two Wayne Taylor cars. Um, the wheel and engineering team went over. So the usual suspects in that class. Um, 13 cars in LMP2. Basically the usual there. And then 11 in GT Pro. Uh, some, drive, some teams are running three, at least in the GTD, there's a three driver um, minimum there. Uh, in this race, where yeah, you look at GT Pro, they only have two drivers for all the teams. Um, yeah, the Pro Am class, you need to have three, and one of them has to be a bronze. Uh, there's, what is it, one, two uh, cars that definitely have three Hevo. Um, otherwise, everything is two, for the exception of Proton um, Mustang sampling Porsche. And then, um, G and then you have GTD with 21, so 21 cars there, and nothing really uh, standout-ish in terms of the entry list for that. Um, Indy next at uh, at Laguna Seca. Uh, Jagger Jones is going to be um, coming back to the series, so that'll be welcome sight. Um, Jacob Abel leads the points by uh, 19 over Louis Foster. And Kyle Collette is uh, 20, yeah, 50, 70, 77, 16, yeah, 77 points. Out of Kyle Collette, Nolan Siegel missed the race uh, this past race at uh, Road America um, to race the Indy car. So now he's down to fourth. Reese Gold rounds out the top five, uh, tied with Callum Hedge for fifth. Then you have Miles Rowe, um, Michael D. Orlando, Jamie Chadwick coming off of her first career victory in Indy Lights and then Jonathan Brown rounding out the top 10. Um, let's see. So that's Indy next. Then F2 for Formula 2 is uh, the points getting it to Barcelona, Paul Aaron has a two-point lead over Isaac Hadjar, 11 on St. Maloney. After that, I mean, it's pretty far back. You have Hauger, um, which is 24 points back, uh, 30 points back for Gabriel Bartoletto in, um, in fifth. And Andrea Kimi Antonelli, uh, who's... Um, Currently, um, sixth in points. Oh, uh, yeah, it's one of these yeah, people. I mean, yeah, so um, that's the point there. Uh, the rest of the Americans are, are on the grid, or people that you would know are kind of buried. I mean, Crawford 11th, um, Cushmine 9th. So, something to look at. Um, they'll race. Three consecutive weekends, so Barcelona, Spielberg, and then Silverstone before the uh, usual uh, you know, summer or break, which is, I think, along uh, gated because of the Olympics. So. In uh, F3, uh, the points there... Uh, C. Gabrielle Mini by lead by four over Luke Browning, by eight over Luca Forneroli, and then um, and Daniel Baganovic. That last one's holding out uh, to um, fourteen points back. So we'll see what any of those guys can do. Um, 
Sebastian Montoya in 15th in points. Uh, Max Easternson, uh, the American 22nd. Uh, so that's F3. And then we have F1 Academy. They've been on a break for a while. So they haven't raced since uh, early May. Um, and then the next round they're going to have is two months from now at Zanfort. So it's quite a schedule. Uh, Abby Pulling has a um, 34-point lead on De um, Dorian Penn, who's not gonna, who was not at uh, Le Mans to drive for the Iron Dames, but supposedly will be in Barcelona for the F1 Academy. Woog and Chloe Chambers, who celebrated her birthday a few days ago, and Bianca Bustamante uh, battling each other for fourth and fifth. And Neri Marti and Hamna Alcabasi. So those are all. Those four only are separated by 10 points. Um, then the last but not least is the NHRA Virginia Nationals. Uh, trying to see the uh, yeah, event info. Um, schedule. Uh, you have all four major pro categories plus pro mod um, this weekend. Um, Tony Stewart. Um, we'll look at the standings. Um, after eight races, uh, Tony Stewart is in ninth in points, five points out of former champion Brittany Force. Um, but plugging along, they announced Dodge. Um, Tia Dodge SRT Direct Connection announced that they're gonna have, make an extension with Tony Stewart Racing and NHRA, so that's good news for them. You now the points battle: Coletta has a 22-point lead over Justin Ashley and 48 over Sean Langdon, um, Coletta's teammate. Uh, then in uh, yeah, when it comes to the. Uh, yeah, for Funny Car, Austin Proc leads by 64 over John Force. And then um, gets a little much little bigger gap there for Todd Hagen, um, etc. Dallas Glenn has 21 point lead, Eric Anders, and 35 on Eric. I mean, 21 on Greg Anderson, 35 on Eric Anders. Um, and then in Proson Motorcycle, it's Gage Herrera benefit. Doesn't matter what you bring. Um, that's going to be virtually impossible to gain that kind of time um, with these other bikes that are much older. But we'll see what happens there in the NHRA. So, back on to the picks. He had uh, Josh pick first, so I'll pick first um, for... Spanish Grand Prix, I feel like it's more of the status quo. So I'm going to go with um, here. So F1 Spanish Grand Prix um, is um, Phil will go with Fish Lips to win, um, Norris in second, and um, why am I thinking? Yes, and then um, Leclerc will uh, round out the podium uh, for me. Um, how about you, Josh? Uh, I'm going to go Lando Norris winning, um, mm -hmm. Fish Lips, and then George Russell in third. Oh, so, okay. yeah. So sure going about, with the... yeah, well, I'm saying not sure about Ferrari there because they've had problems recently, but um, there and uh, what's his face Perez, I think has a grid grid penalty this week after 
his wreck or whatever on uh, Canadian Grand Prix. Yeah, so then the it's not like he has been qualifying very well to begin with, so that doesn't help his cause. And, um, you know, at Ferrari, it could be an issue for them, like you mentioned, uh, at Canada, but I think Catalonia is more like uh, the, some of the other circuits they've been on so far this year. So we'll see how that um, transpires. Oh, I'm trying to bring that up. Yeah, so the next uh, thing will be the Indy cars at Laguna Seca are picks for pick to win and wild card. And then um, the news, other news, which is Fox will take over exclusive coverage of the Indy cars. Um, they're doing weird stuff. Yeah, the, yeah, so with Laguna Seca. Bring up the entry list. Yeah, you have um, people that are mad about, you know, they're they're back at at the racetrack, even though it's a, a good thing for the town and all that. But um, trying to look for the points. Um, Um, Indy car points right now. Will Power leads by Alex Pillow, uh, leads by five over Alex Pillow and 11 over Scott Dixon. Um, then in the yeah, from fourth through to seventh is what 12 points. We can get real, real far and get 14 15 points in New Garden. Rossi Rosenquist rounding out the top ten. Um, trying to see, yes, yeah, so there's a nineteen. Um, and it's like, yeah. So then there's a twenty, twenty-one. Yeah. So it was a twentieth. Yeah. So twenty sets. Yeah. Then um. 21, 22. So, yeah, so then that'll be top 11. Josh, you went last on F1. So, what say you on IndyCar at Laguna Seca? Yeah, I think I'm going to go with uh, Scott Dixon winning. I think, you know, with uh, how Road America went for him, not a great uh, result there. So, I'm going to pick him. Uh, to get back into the winner's column uh, this week and extend his points lead over his teammate, Alex Pelot. Uh I will pick, uh, uh, I guess, you know, I'm going to go with Graham Rahal this week. Again, as usual, as a wild card, running a sick uh, Mobile One paint scheme there, so or livery there this weekend. So uh, hopefully that one can come up to the top 10 at least and get a good result there. Yeah, I was going to go and pick Graham because of his paint scheme largely um, and somewhat upgraded pace there, but I uh, guess I can't do that. So um, in terms of my pick for uh, Laguna, I am going to go with... Um, I think I'm going to go with uh, Scotty McLaughlin. Uh, I'll go with Scott McLaughlin as my winner. The curse of I'm a wiener. Um, then I will say, um, yeah, I'll say Marcus Erickson um, will be my wild card so who did i say i said mclaughlin and marcus erickson so those are my picks uh, mclaughlin to win um erickson wild card 
All right, so then the last is uh, we'll go on uh, one site and um, have to click for minutes just to get, yeah, so um, in terms of the Xfinity series, it's the PsyApps 200. Um, you have 39 for 38. Uh, you have some people that are relatively new or people that have been around but haven't um, gotten opportunities. Some guy named Glenn Reen will be in the 35 for Joey Gase. Uh, Jade Buford in the 74. Carson Quapple, 88. Nathan Bird, 92. Patrick Emerling running majority of your balance of season in the 07. With Logan Bearden um, rounding out that list. You have Corey Heim driving for Sam Hunt again. Um, Christopher Bell will be in the 20. Justin Bonsignor making his Xfinity debut will be in the 19. Um, Alex Bowman driving the 17 for Hendrick. And then you have, um, yeah, so that's, those are the, you have two cup guys and one truck guy. Uh, 41 entries there. So, um, Trying to, yeah, so, um, where are we at? So, yeah, I picked last on the IndyCar, so I'll go first for, um, Xfinity. NASCAR Xfinity at New Hampshire. New area, New Hampshire. Um, the Xfinity series for me, my pick will be I have to go and bring up the points. Uh the points for the Xfinity series driver point. Uh, 15 starts, so you have, you know, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 people, so that's the top, just outside. Yeah, so my pick for the winner this week at New Hampshire is going to be, I'm going to go and say, Justin Allgaier, um, because why not? Uh, he's been uber consistent, so that's, um, I think, safe, safe play. So, you know, Phil goes with Allgaier to win, and then the wild card. Based on the points, I'm going to go with Justin Bonsignor in his um, Xfinity debut. Um, um, it's not the first time. I mean, you had uh, Ryan Priest drive for them at Iowa and win years ago, which basically they brought it up on the race where catapulted his career in the major um, three NASCAR series. All right, Josh. Um, what about you for the Xfinity series? Yeah, this is an interesting one, but um, I'm, well, I'm going to go chalk here. I'll go Chris Bell uh, in the Xfinity series. So uh, in the number 20 this week uh, for Joe Gibbs. So uh, I'll pick Chris Bell to win here uh on saturday and uh i will go with uh wild card um i will go with uh parker retzlaff here okay yeah we seem to pick paperboy a lot but you know one of these days it'll pay off um 
Yeah, so there you go. I represent Gibbs, got Junior Motorsports, etc. going on there. So then the last is NASCAR Cup. Uh, the Cup Series. Hampshire. And then, um, yeah, Josh, you can give us your picks for Cup Series at uh, New Hampshire. Uh, going to go with Go with and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go with Chris Bell. I'll just say Chris Bell winning both the sweep. Go for the sweep on Saturday and on Sunday. Uh, so I'm going to go with Chris Bell winning the race. Uh, very close at Gateway, which I feel like is sort of a similar track to uh, New Hampshire. And I'm going to go with uh, Josh Berry coming off the top 10 finish there uh, at Iowa. Yeah, Josh Berry is definitely someone that, for the time being, where he's just he's still in the wild card side. It's um, he's a great pick there, and he's been running well um, on the short to uh, um, these shorter ovals. Uh, definitely suit him well. So um, for. Um, yeah, there's, um, uh, for me, the entry list is going, checking it out. Um, I am going to pick, I'm going to pick, um, I'm going to do anything. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to go with um, Martin Truex at one of his 76 home tracks. Um, so let's fill. I think this is like one of his two actual home tracks. Yeah, this is this and Dover based. Yeah, this Dover and Watkins Glen, I guess, would, I mean... Pocono. <laughs> yeah, and then, po yeah, so... That's four. <laughs> I think he considers, yeah, I, I think... Dover is his actual home Dover track. Dover is the one that they say is his closest to his home track, so... But I think anything on the northeast, in the northeast, counts for them, since they don't go very often. Um, and, uh... The uh, the points uh, go through uh, that. So the driver points you got um, twenty five. Really, yeah. So it's thirty four. So it's seventeen. Um, I am gonna go. With, uh, yeah, I'm going to go on my wild card. I'm going to go with Todd Gilland, um, who's been running better, um, in recent weeks and now has a Gilland wild card with, um, with an extension. So that's, uh, good for them with all the changes they're making at front row motorsports um they want the continuity with um gillen so we'll see what he's able to do um uh, at or at new hampshire all right josh uh your time to shine here on the sim segment yeah of course uh you know this week on iRacing um me i'm muted there sorry but uh yeah this week on high racing got um on the of course oval side all i think all the series ovals have 
uh, for NASCAR, uh, New Hampshire, um, for Cup and Xfinity at least, um, and in, I guess, Legends Series 87s uh, at, at uh, where is it, at Bristol for some reason, so, and Arca Menard Series Arca Cars at North Wilkesboro, Fixed Indy Car Series at Laguna Seca, Indy Oval fixed at uh, uh, at Las Vegas, Gen Four Cup at Las Vegas as well. Um, truck Series at Nashville, so the Truck Series at Nashville different than from the uh, NASCAR Xfinity and Cup Series um, there. So got that for the Oval Series. Um, I guess the Cars Tour at Nashville Fairgrounds series. Uh, you've got the fixed truck series um, at uh, Nashville as well. Uh, Rookie Legends uh, SRX at Bristol there. And then sports car side, uh, Rainmaster Circuit Navarra. I guess that's a new circuit that's come out here. Uh, Summit Point Raceway, the GR Cup. Toyota GR Cup, uh, BMW Power M Tour at Nurburgring on the Grand Prix circuit. Um, you've got, uh, let's see what else, uh, Ferrari GT3 at Circuit Navarra here. Um, you've got the Mustang Skip Barber Challenge on the Daytona Road Course. That might actually be interesting uh, to run there. Uh, Stock Car Brazil at the circuit they let in on. Um, We've got MX5, Global MX5 Cup, Rookie Series at Circuit London on as well. Um, we've got, uh, let's see, Watkins Glen, six hours of Watkins Glen coming up this weekend, I think. So that should be, that should be fun. C-Class uh, sports car there uh, with any of the sports cars, GR, uh, Ferrari GT3, Acura MX GTP there. So, uh, got that there. That's on sports car racing this week. Oh, and uh, what else? Uh, I think I had some other um, series there, but uh, the Clio Cup, Knock Hill Racing Circuit there. Uh, production Car Challenge at Mount Panorama this week. And Formula Cars, uh, Formula Fords at Okayama Circuit, Skip Barber, Laguna Seca, um, uh, F4, Mid-Ohio, as I mentioned, IndyCar, WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca, uh, IndyCar, or Formula Ford 1600 at Branch Hatch there this week. Uh, got the, uh, yeah, Formula, uh, I guess the Formula One car at Catalonia this week. So got that uh, there. Um, so yeah, that's all basically all I racing this week for the regular series. Um, there is an interesting announcement though in terms of uh, news this week. Let me pull that up. Um, IndyCar. So iRacing has a new IndyCar league that they're implementing the iRacing IndyCar. Qualifying series presented by Butt Kicker, uh, which is a Butt Kicker is a sim uh, accessory for sound, make things more realistic in terms of feel. Uh, but it's a qualifying series um, set to determine uh, who who can you know be the best on the premier circuits of the real world IndyCar calendar to determine who competes for the series inaugural championship. The top thirty three eligible from the qualifying series will be invited to the Pro Series where they'll fight for a share of a $50,000 prize pool starting in September. Um, and the schedule is starts out Long Beach, 40 laps. Indianapolis Oval, 66 laps. Barber Motorsports Park, 39 laps. IMS Road Course, uh, 37 laps. Gateway, uh, 108 laps. Road America, 26 laps. And then Mid-Ohio is a 40-lap race. So those take place on Thursdays at 8 p.m. ET. Uh, single sessions with the qualifying session, uh, and then drivers' top six uh, scores out of seven determine their final place in the standings. 
and to be eligible you must have a a level formula car license so yeah very very cool to see that uh so give iRacers a chance to be the best at IndyCar and real money involved here for a share of fifty thousand dollars so uh, a lot at stake there for uh, iRacers that are really good uh, on the IndyCar side so that should be fun uh, to uh, look out look out for uh, in the coming weeks so yeah that was one piece of information that was really exciting of course now uh, season three iRacing underway now for the summer so uh, that should be definitely a lot of fun there so yeah that's it for the iRacing last week um and everything so yeah as as always yeah twitch stream you sailor 2 go in there and watch all the streams um and then uh at uh jp huffine on twitter of course big news last week trevor lawrence getting re-signed to the jacksonville jaguars for 275 million dollars uh for the next uh five years so we'll be seeing trevor lawrence all the way through uh until 2031 so uh, I think 2030, 2031. So, uh, very, very good to see that, uh, of course. And, um, also, yeah, I've been talking about that on Twitter, of course, trying to defend my boy from, uh, all the, uh, uh, haters on there that think he didn't deserve that, of course. And being the second highest player or I guess tied number one player in the NFL with Joe Burrow in terms of pay there. So, yeah, whatever, um, and everything. So, uh, glad, glad to see that play out, of course, uh and uh hopefully it gets rewarded in the uh uh season upcoming here in the fall so we'll hopefully we'll see that and of course uh gripship podcast our youtube page at gripship podcast on youtube go there and subscribe everything's up there and go and like comment and subscribe to our uh page there so yeah of course uh glad as always to do it and you know be able to talk about all the racing course and um being able to uh do that and of course uh yeah, being able to uh, talk about all the sim racing as well. So yeah, let you do the close. Yep, absolutely. And um, always grateful for all uh, the contributions and insight that you bring. Um, to why uh, this deal works? Uh, great uh, team, be able to bounce everything off, and um, and that's that's what it is. We go over all these different series and having a uh, do it differently. We do it differently than most shows. We give you multiple series in one spot. You can hear everything here and then uh, move forward and um, get as much knowledge. And even this week now, we added some golf in there. So um, we're probably going to come up with some different uh, things to talk about as that break comes along. Uh, where three major series, I think, are all on break around the same time, um, too, because of the Olympics from NBC, and then Formula One does their summer break, so that'll all kind of coincide together, so it'll be interesting how that all works out. Might have some uh, big-time guests on the show. Um, to find out more, of course, you can follow us at Gripster Pod on Twitter. You can find me at Philip or PG Matthew twenty eight on Twitter. You can find me at Philip G Matthew twenty eight on Instagram. Um, find the Gripster Podcast podcast. God, find the Gripster Podcast at Philip G Matthew dot com and um, Podbean, where is our host site? Uh, the YouTube page, of course, at Josh handles we've got i have my own personal page which also has the audio so you get the video on josh on the grip strip podcast uh youtube on my personal page you can find um the audio along with the the shares once i share it um through podbean so with that uh we will uh move forward into Next episode, um, episode 226, where we will uh, go over NASCAR at New Hampshire, IndyCar, Laguna, um, and then the Spanish Grand Prix for Formula One. Um, 
And we'll also go through everything that's in the roundup and um, any anything else that's going on in the world of motorsports we'll talk about here on the Grifter Podcast. So for Josh, I'm Phil. Thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting. Tell your friends about us. And um, we'll see you next time.